Principles. My name is Warren Maybe, and I'm the director of the Queen's uh, School of Policy Studies. Uh, it's my pleasure to host this session of the Queen's Contagion Culture Lecture Series. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to note that I'm currently sitting uh, on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, we like to recognize this at the beginning of all of our formal sessions. Uh, it's important for us to keep in mind uh, the peoples that came before us, the peoples that still live on these lands, uh, and uh, the freedom that we have to live and to work and to study on these lands. This is a series of lectures that we have put together um, at the School of Policy Studies and, and with colleagues across Queen's University uh, to really look at the long-term ramifications of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and the impacts that it will have on a whole variety of different policy areas. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about uh, the Canadian Armed Forces, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. And we're really lucky to have uh, two preeminent uh, speakers with us. Uh, first, Christian Luprecht, who is the director of the Institute for Intergovernmental Relations here at Queen's, also the class of 1965 professor, uh, professor in leadership in the Department of Political Science at the Royal Military College. Uh, Christian has been uh, a really, really powerful voice in these areas, and I'm really glad that, that Christian is able to join us today. Uh, we also have Peter Kasharak who is an independent researcher today uh, who works in the areas of military history and defense studies. He is an adjunct professor in the Department of Continuing Studies at the Royal Military College of Canada. Uh, so to both Christian and Peter, welcome. Thank you for, for joining us today, uh, remotely as it is. Uh, I'm delighted that you're able to, to join us. Uh, Christian and Peter have collaborated on an article for uh, the CG, the Center for International Governance Innovation, CG, uh, series that has been put together uh, looking at, uh, just pulling up my details here, uh, a summary of security, intelligence, and the global health crisis. And they have written an, uh, a chapter, an article, looking at the Canadian Armed Forces and humanitarian and disaster relief, defining the role of the Canadian Armed Forces in this. And so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I believe I can hand over to uh, Christian at this point. Christian, do you want to kick off? Or would we go with Peter first? Um, yeah, so I, I can quickly frame it. So in part of this was motivated by uh, the uh, um, uh, both an, an op-ed of mine in the Global Mail with which Peter took some issue um, and so there's always good creative uh, good creative tension but I think also the broader sort of concerns about that we seem to be uh, asking the Canadian Armed Forces to do a whole lot of things and a whole lot of things more that even 25 years ago or so we weren't asking the armed forces to do and so um, both the the uh, the expanse the complexity the type of humanitarian disaster assistance uh, along with many other functions and tasks that Canadian armed forces are asked to perform and they are asked to perform this with uh, uh, fewer resources than for instance they had even 25 years ago and so this is a part a specific discussion about humanitarian disaster uh, relief and assistance uh, not just for the Kenyan armed force but for militaries around the world but also broader conversation about um, resource allocation for the armed forces that seem to have become a a favorite go-to instrument uh, on a whole number of fronts and so um, a part of the motivation when uh, Wesley Wark and Aaron Schull at uh, CG uh, asked whether I contribute a piece on the Canadian Armed Forces and National Defense uh, to this volume uh, for teaming up with Peter is that uh, uh, Peter has uh, literally decades of experience uh, on the National Defense file for uh, the office of the Auditor General where he worked um, uh, before this. And so Peter brings an extremely intricate understanding um, of uh, the organization, but also of the frameworks within which the organization operates. So before we go into the, 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 the actual, before we go into the actual paper, 
um, I figured I'd just maybe give Peter, Peter a couple of minutes to, to talk about the office because it's often a bit enigmatic uh, uh, to, uh, to many, I think, outsiders. You, every few months you hear that the Auditor General put out a report on, on this or that, uh, uh, but give Peter sort of a chance to talk about his expertise um, and about the, uh, um, the Auditor General. Sure, thanks, Christian. Uh, I was a little surprised when Christian said that the office was enigmatic. The insiders thought, we always thought we were extremely well known. Um, the AG is an agent of parliament, which means that it's sort of a funny organization. It's, it's part of the public service, but not controlled by the executive. The AG is uh, a, a government and council appointment for 10 years at behavior. So once you pick one, you're more or less stuck with him or her for 10 years. So they're very independent. And the duties are to do the public accounts or the books. And that's done about half the staff, professional staff do the books. The rest of us did uh, performance audit. And the AG Act says the Auditor General can, should report to, periodically to Parliament on anything of a nature and significance. So it's totally open what an AG chooses to report on. There are some examples in the act, uh, economy, efficiency, the reporting of effectiveness by departments, which is sort of a, an open door for us to go in and see how effectiveness is being managed or not. And finally, uh, environment and sustainable development. The AG has got access to everything. There, we have access to all records, no matter what form. Um, and we're, we're, we can also uh, ask for uh, explanations from officials, and we could do it under, under, under subpoena, under oath, if necessary. I don't know if that's ever been done, but we could. Uh, and we have immunity for any good faith reporting to Parliament. So it's a, quite an independent role. AG tries to avoid politics. Uh, which is almost impossible since we're going to go, go in and comment on the functioning of major government programs. It's got to be political somewhere, but the AG will try to avoid being blatantly political or, or partisan shading in his or her reports. Uh, there are controls on the number and timing of AG reports, which are meant to uh, obviate that. And um, uh, uh, also, there are, are self-imposed restraints by the AG just to try to avoid uh, being partisan. So what gets audited? Uh, anything we think of in, is it of interest to Parliament. Uh, we look at program criticality, we look at cost, we look at risk. Uh, and uh, I should, I'll just close by saying doing audit work is not really for the faint-hearted. It's quite adversarial. Uh, departments get 12 weeks to comment on your report and the entire staff structure of uh, NDHQ will bear down on a report and try to find the flaws in it and tell you about it. So you have to judge whether uh, you wish to change your report or not. Uh, and it's a zero defect environment. As the audit principle for defense and security, uh, I had to sign uh, something before anything was published that this report contains no errors. So if you've done any academic work at all, you uh, are probably cognizant of the fact that that's a pretty risky statement, but we do our best. So that's AG in a nutshell. If anybody wants to contact me afterwards for more details, please do so. That's great. And uh, that's a good segue for me to say, uh, we're going to go through a formal presentation or discussion between Christian and Peter. Um, as we go through, you're going to uh, have questions pop into your mind. You're going to have things that you want to ask. If you move your mouse around, you'll see a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you click on that, uh, a window will come up where you can pose questions. Uh, this is the way that we've chosen to interact. Uh, this way we can keep track of everybody's questions and make sure that we, we uh, get everybody's questions answered. So. Uh, we're going to take some time for a formal presentation or discussion, uh, and then we'll take some time for some Q&A after that, and we will be wrapped up uh, just before five o'clock. So I'll hand back over to Christian to, to start us off. So uh, thanks, 
worn. Um, and there is a, there's a shorter op-ed version that should be running in the Hill Times shortly. And then in September, you'll get the, uh, there'll be the full study. And so I hope that this is, it's one of these areas where there's relatively little literature, let alone scholarly literature, not just in Canada, but across the world. And yet it's growing in importance. So this is sort of part of an effort to try to build more, a bit more of the, uh, of, of a baseline um, for more informed public discussion. And, as you saw, um, Peter, not just with his own uh, background on defense, but also uh, as a scholar who's written on the reserves, and uh, that's a very tough expertise to find, um, uh, is, a, uh, is, a, is a perfect and formidable partner for this paper. Uh, so the context of this is, of course, the, the pandemic here where uh, 22,000 CAF members were put on standby, just to give people sort of a sense of what that means. So. Uh, the CAFs at about, I guess, four strengths, 68, 69,000 or so, um, you take out uh, maybe 7,000 people who in one way or another either can't be deployed or, or, uh, or are on training or so, uh, and then add in the reservists. I mean, you're looking at about, uh, you're probably looking at over uh, between the regular force and reserve force, uh, a quarter of the, of, the, of, of the active force that is actually um, that was actually put on standby for this effort. So that's a significant commitment uh, within the organization. Um, the best known part of that deployment is of course the 1700 members that were deployed to long-term care homes, an issue that uh, we will get back to um, uh, in a moment. And so the context for this is that uh, uh, we provide a, a table in the paper that shows that there have been more of these types of operations. So between 2011 and 2020, uh, there were 30 um, um, humanitarian disaster assistance mission by the Kenyan Armed Forces compared to six between 1990 and 2010. Uh, so you can see this is a massive growth in, uh, in operation. And in 2017-18 alone, there were 10 weather-related uh, missions relative to 20 between 2007 and 2016, uh, but only 12 such missions between um, 1996 and 2006. So you can see that uh, weather in one way or another is having a major impact on growing demand, uh, but that there are other contexts that we'll get to in terms of that demand. And so the Chief of Defense Staff, Jonathan Vance, has testified before committee and let me quote, it's now almost routine. We have, I think, for the last three years deployed to support provinces in firefighting and managing floods. It's now becoming a routine occurrence, which it had not been in the past. And we take that into consideration in terms of the force structure and employment of the reserves. And so it's almost become predictable because in March and April, uh, you're likely going to have a call out for floods. In July and August, uh, there's a good prospect of having a call up uh, for wildfires and, uh, and firefighting. And this is a particular impact on the army that provides a lot of the hands um, uh, for these types of call outs. Um, and so what the Chief of Defense Staff is hinting at here is of having to make um, difficult decisions in terms of minimizing the disruption uh, that these call outs pose in the annual planning cycle. And so we'll get back to this at the end of the paper, but it raised some interesting questions about what should the priorities of the Canadian Armed Forces be um, and how do we weigh off uh, these different priorities um, against one another. Um, there is also concern when we talk about the priorities here uh, for uh, the impact this is having on Canadian Armed Forces more broadly. So uh, we have a larger scale of deployments. They're being deployed on a more frequent basis. Uh, the commander of the army has commented and that um, this, in his words, is uh, starting to affect the readiness of the Canadian Armed Forces. And so implicit in this uh, conversation about readiness is a sense that the Canadian Armed Forces primary, uh, if you want, tasking seems to be sort of a combat tasking and these other elements are elements uh, that um, kind of come into play along the way and that we need to balance off against uh, uh, that combat tasking. And so we'll get back to sort of this conversation at the end about what this actually uh, that means for the Canadian Armed Forces and how you prioritize resources and uh, roles. But it's certainly sort of implicit by what we hear from the uniformed leadership that the Canadian Armed Forces would like to prioritize and preserve uh, the combat 
role. But just because the Kenyan Armed Forces tends to think of itself as an expeditionary force, the question is, does it necessarily need to be that way? And should combat necessarily be the overriding uh, role and priority for the Canadian Armed Forces? That then provides a broader context for a conversation that has been ongoing for many years, which is that defense spending makes up about a quarter of direct program spending for the federal government, uh, about $22 billion. And so the conversation that uh, in particular with the prime minister's office, regardless of which political stripe in terms of we're spending $22 million on this organization, what sort of return are we getting on this organization? And it turns out that of course, um, humanitarian disaster assistance is very popular with politicians. Uh, it's popular with the Canadian Armed Forces and the members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, it's a, vis a way to be visible. It's a good recruit tool for the Canadian Armed Forces, but it raised the questions about what are the real costs and the real benefits of these types of deployments uh, for the Canadian Armed Forces. And so in terms of the cost and benefit analysis, there are some critics who say that uh, the humanitarian, uh, uh, the HADAR role is simply uh, taking up too much time, too much effort, too many resources, and so it should be removed from the Canadian Armed Forces altogether. Or there's voices who say, well, it should be removed from the regular force, and we should just make it a reserve capability. Or there's people who say, well, actually, we shouldn't have the armed forces involved at all, and we should stand up a separate uh, federal agency. And so we trade off uh, these different options um, at the end of the paper and their um, uh, and the benefits that they offer. Certainly reservists have a bit of a comparative advantage here. They're already present in their communities uh, and they tend to be general purpose, although under the strengthening the army reserve strategy, there's been an effort uh, to try to build out some specialized capabilities um, within the reserves. But it certainly raised the question among the people who say that the, it should be a reserve capability or the reserves should be involved, whether the reserves are actually postured uh, for the HADAR mission. And so we have the changing frequency of deployments, changing nature of the missions and the resources that are required um, raised the questions about also not just the logic and the priority of the Kenyan Armed Forces, but also the logic and the priorities that inform the reserves. So you can see how this conversation has a significant implication uh, for the posture of the Canadian Armed Forces um, overall. And so the fundamental question in the paper then is how should the military and government react to the increased and growing demand uh, for humanitarian and disaster relief. There's no question that this is a core military role, it, although it's a um, non-traditional application of military power. Um, and so we'll look at these debates in the context of HADAR tasking since 1997, and we'll try to provide um, a sense of some recommendations on what sort of might be some of the policy changes we should be considering in terms of mitigating disaster risk. Um, how do we need to clarify the role of the Kenyan Armed Forces when it comes to humanitarian disaster assistance? Um, and uh, what is the best allocation of federal resources and funds when it comes to uh, disaster assistance and uh, broader requirements on the one hand to mitigate uh, these types of disasters, and the, on the other hand, to be able to surge uh, semi-skilled or unskilled labor uh, in an expeditious fashion um, in response to humanitarian or a call for humanitarian disaster resist, uh, assistance. So at this point, I'll hand over to uh, Peter to put, the Kenyan, uh, to put the role of the Kenyan Armed Forces, sort of talk about the domestic role of the Kenyan Armed Forces. Thanks, Christian. Uh, uh, I'm going to end up uh, uh, partially contradicting uh, uh, some of the things that uh, Christian said, or at least one thing. Um, you ha it should needs to be recognized right from the start that domestic role is tremendously an unpopular role in the upper reaches of Canadian forces, if not down to the middle reaches of the officer corps, uh, the, especially the Army. The Army has fought since World War II to preserve itself as a combat force, and even more importantly, as a heavily armed, mini great state armed force. And domestic role has not fit well into this. Uh, it has, it was uh, uh, very unpopular when Trudeau in 69 uh, put up uh, uh, one of the, the key roles of the forces was to have it was to have a domestic uh, 
a domestic security role and a domestic development role. Uh, this didn't really go down so well. Uh, and this was a constant theme in the 70s and 80s. And in the 90s, uh, came back in the Canada 21 group, which is a bunch of prominent unemployed liberals who came up with a very well thought out comprehensive force structure plan for the Canadian forces that put a lot of emphasis on a uh, domestic role and having it a light force, once again, very unpopular. But it, this was condemned as a constabulary role for the forces. Um, in terms of the reserves, here there's some subtle uh, distinctions that need to be drawn. While, as Christian said, the popular role, but it's only popular to a certain extent. It's popular when you ask individual reservists uh, uh, what they thought of a, of a Hatter role that they performed. And they're all enthusiastic about it then because they get out and they did something positive for the community and they got a lot of positive feedback and they feel good about themselves. Also, uh, uh, reserve CEOs have always wanted to uh, be able to assist their local politicians, mayors, whatever, uh, provincial premiers. Uh, but on the other hand, the reserves are harbored a lot of suspicion that the regular force treats them as the Cinderella, that they get all the, all the bad jobs that the regular force would like to offload. And this, in fact, during the Diefenbaker government, uh, when uh, nuclear war became a, con a real concern, uh, the government initiated what they call the National Survival Program, which was to be largely staffed by the reserves. And this quickly became known as snakes and ladders uh, because you're using ropes and ladders to try to uh, uh, extract victims from collapsed buildings. Uh, very unpopular with the reserves. The reserves uh, are very jealous of their combat role and do not want to see it diminished or turned into uh, 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 something else. So you've got military cultures at work here are around the actual roles that need to be taken into account. Just because you assign the role to the Canadian forces doesn't mean that uh, it's going to get done or done well. And if you don't believe me, read Peter Fever's book on armed servants and how military shirk uh, unpopular roles. Uh, the next dimension is the size of the actual role. And we did some work on this. Uh, I don't know. These are the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, deployments that we could get off the uh, uh, d, d website, the Hatter deployments. Uh, it, it says 2010 to 2010, it should be to 2020. Uh, and as you can see, when you look at the number uh, of deployments by duration, that nearly all of them are quite short, uh, uh, less, than, less than a couple of weeks. So uh, you only have a few, uh, four deployments or 17% of the ones for which we could get numbers were, were, were more than four weeks. So these, the usual Hatter assignment is really quite short in time. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, personnel deployed. They're also very small in terms of number of uh, personnel deployed. You can see here that 31% that, uh, uh, required fewer than 100 uh, uh, personnel and another 37% required 100 to 500. The really, in terms of a trend, are these things getting larger? It's difficult to say. It would seem that recently we're getting a lot of uh, more than 2,000 uh, personnel required deployments, but the really big deployments in recent history were the Red River floods, which needed uh, 12,000 people or 8,000 people, and the uh, 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 ice storm uh, in 93, I think, uh, that required uh, 12,000 people. So when you if you plotted using that as your baseline, it would still be declining. Although if you drop them off, 
you can see a, a, an increase. Uh, at any rate, uh, the end of the story is that the current burden should be well within the capability of the Canadian forces. Uh, most of them are short. Most of them uh, don't require a lot of people. Uh, when they do require, uh, what they do require often is aviation, uh, because uh, a lot of uh, northern commute there are extractions of residents from endangered northern communities, either floods or wildfires, and so there's aviation and sometimes engineering resources required. Otherwise, it's just bodies. We need bodies to dike. We need bodies to go around neighborhoods and knock on doors and help uh, extract uh, residents. Uh, and it's just a plain manpower situation. So that's what the ground looks like as can be seen from publicly available information. So now I'll flip it back to Christian. So the, the, the lift capability is also part of the story of the pandemic that uh, hasn't been told much. Mm. Uh, of course, how did much of the personal protective gear get across the country and why is it that no part of the country actually ran out of gear? Um, at least in a, in, a, in a macro sort of perspective, it's because the, the Air Force became a critical instrument in uh, moving kit um, across, uh, across the country. So again, we have uh, the pandemic here uh, illustrates the two key elements that, uh, for which the uh, hater deployments uh, um, matter in particular, so the lift capability, but also, as we mentioned, the 1,700 troops, two months uh, across two provinces, and the two reports the Canadian Armed Forces uh, put out uh, on Operation Laser in terms of what uh, they found uh, to their respective provincial governments in Ontario and Quebec are very instructive because if you read them carefully, um, it suggests that uh, while the Canadian Armed Forces did provide specialized capabilities, um, much of it was relatively straightforward shortcomings in management uh, and administration uh, that could have been um, uh, rectified with um, better inspections, more aggressive and remedial actions um, at the provincial level. Um, and you can test this comparatively because of course not uh, the Canadian Armed Forces luckily only had to go into a small select uh, number of facilities. And so some of what the Canadian Armed Forces were doing was basically picking up uh, the pieces where um, uh, just um, systems management, administrative leadership uh, um, capabilities um, um, uh, would have perhaps not required a deployment or as, or as great a deploy uh, deployment. Um, they're deployed under the Emergencies Act, which sets out the response for uh, the federal government, uh, where the provinces are uh, the prime respondents to humanitarian disaster assistance, um, and so they can then call uh, on the federal government uh, under provision that dates back to confederation uh, to assist um, if they feel that um, a demand exceeds provincial capacity to respond. And the federal government responds is something called the Federal Emergency Response Plan. But what we've seen is, so the federal government, the CAF should be a source of last resort, but we have at least three documented cases uh, where the Canadian Armed Forces and the federal government have become, uh, where there's a trend to them becoming a, a first resort in terms of responding. So you remember earlier this year, Canadian Armed Forces deployed to Newfoundland. Well, it turns out, um, and everything that we report here is open source, you can track it in our, in our study, that Newfoundland has disbanded its emergency measures organization altogether, uh, notwithstanding it being Newfoundland and notwithstanding climate change. Uh, so this hints at sort of broader fiscal challenges in some provinces in terms of service delivery and particularly uh, emergency service delivery. And so uh, the federal government and federal resources become sort of this uh, first resort uh, when you have a crisis. And of course, if you don't have an emergency measures organization, it also means you don't have someone on the ground who can help coordinate you. So it also means you have to show up with different capabilities because you effectively uh, have to do a lot of the coordination that otherwise might be provided by an emergency uh, measures um, organization. And so uh, this then raised a question about a zero sum game. If we had a serious crisis overseas um, and the government had decided to deploy the Kenya Armed Forces for that crisis, hater resources may not be available or available to the extent or on sort of the timeline that provinces have come to expect. Uh, 
Um, and so the question is, is the Kenyan Armed Forces necessarily the optimal provider for emergency assistance? Um, and so much of what the Kenyan Armed Forces provide is essentially a requirement for general labor, uh, for which the, the Kenyan Armed Forces are a reliable but very expensive source. And so there's three inferences that follow from our observations. The first is that it's a bit disconcerting, this trend that we see um, in provinces going to the federal government for assistance before uh, having exhausted uh, their own capacities. Now, this is really more of a political problem than a policy one, because of course, federal ministers have a hard time saying no to a provincial premier who calls on them. Um, and it's also attractive for both the provincial and the federal government to bring out what is arguably the most visible instrument uh, the government has in order to respond uh, to uh, humanitarian requests for the, uh, in response to humanitarian disaster assistance. Um, but um, it might also possibly be the sole readily available federal resource, uh, something that we'll get back to in a moment. So the first trend then is sort of this disconcerting trend about the Kenyan forces having become trending towards becoming uh, not the last resort that constitutionally and legally they're supposed to be, but um, a, a, an, an increasingly quick um, uh, effort by politicians um, provincially and then response from the federal government to resort to the Canadian Armed Forces to um, respond. I'll hand over to Peter for the second and uh, for the second and third trend. The, the second and third inferences that, that, that we drew from looking at, at the past 10 years of incidents is that uh, the air role is likely squarely belongs to the Canadian Forces. Uh, it's, it seems to be vital to many uh, Hatter incidents large and small, and uh, the country does not need a, a sort of a second Air Force standing in reserve as a fire department just in case for these uh, calls. So the air role, regardless of what other, what, what else you decide to do with the Hatter role and the federal government, I think the air role is gonna stick with, with, with the RCAF. Uh, and thirdly, uh, when you need massive amounts of resources, just that extra, those extra hands, like, like the Winnipeg, uh, the Red River floods, and the ice storm in Eastern Canada, the, the Canadian forces is going to have to be called on. Uh, there's, there's no way that uh, a federal uh, operational force of uh, almost 100,000 people is going to be able to uh, uh, sit it out when tens of thousands of people are needed. So those two roles for sure uh, are going to end up devolving to the forces. So back to Christian. So now the Hatter role in a whole of government context. So first we can observe that under Canada's defense policy, strong, secure, engaged, um, the, the, there's a clear role um, and that uh, Hatter is part of one of, is one of the eight core missions of the Kenyan Armed Forces. Um, so to quote from SSE, strong at home, its sovereignty well defended by Kenyan Armed Forces, also ready to assist in times of natural disaster, other emergencies, and search and rescue. So on the one hand, then our analysis indicates that the demand for the Kenyan Armed Forces Hatter assistance is highly likely to persist and it's possibly uh, quite likely to increase without greater mit mitigation by governments, federal, provincial, and municipal, uh, with a particular emphasis on wildlife and flood mitigation risks. And on the other hand, um, our analysis raises sort of three problems to be addressed. So the first is the moral hazard that we have here um, and created at Confederation, where the federal government essentially backstops provinces that underinvest in emergency response capabilities and then prematurely call on the federal government for assistance. Um, and so technically the federal government can recover costs from the provinces, uh, but you can imagine the optics of that are politically difficult, uh, in particular the optics at a time, for instance, of a pandemic or for provinces that already uh, have a deteriorating fiscal capacity and in the aftermath of a disaster, uh, so you can see that sending a bill from the federal government uh, can be quite, uh, can, can be politically challenging, although there are some efforts to recover some of the costs 
uh, but there's uh, no effort to, and we're not suggesting sort of a full cost recovery. It's just pointing out that the federal government basically assumes the risk here. And so clearly the federal government's best option here is to incentivize provinces to be much more proactive in planning for the consequences of climate change and to create appropriate emergency response capabilities um, at the provincial and also at the, uh, at the local levels. And uh, our data show that floods in particular impose a disproportionately onerous uh, demands of harder on the Canadian armed forces, both in terms of the extent of the length of the deployment and the extent of the deployment. The second problems are some of the asymmetries associated with the federal emergency response, response plan. Um, and it seems when that plan is being evoked uh, that um, we've already seen that uh, the federal government can, as we saw from with regards to the debate about stockpiles for PPE in this country, um, there can be a challenge with regards to adequate resourcing of the civilian emergency management function of the federal government, um, and also the ability to coordinate that function more efficiently and effectively across the federal government, where Public Safety Canada then takes the lead in coordination. And so we think that there's a lot more to be done, uh, both in ensuring that those functions are appropriately resourced um, and that those functions are appropriately exercised in smaller tabletop exercises so that the different players know um, and, and have an intricate understanding of the FERP and their particular role to play, um, uh, to play uh, in, in, in the event of, a, uh, of the FERP being, um, uh, being invoked. And the third problem is this surge of general or semi-skilled labor in an emergency. Uh, and this is of course, particularly disruptive to the armed services and in particular to any combat training and readiness. And so if not the Canadian Armed Forces, then what's, where will we get this source of labor and what should be the federal government's role in maintaining it? And so in response to uh, these three problems, so the moral hazard problem, uh, the um, more optimal implementation of the federal emergency response plan and the um, surge in semi-skilled labor, uh, there are, we think, sort of four basic models of how Canada could respond. And I'll hand over to Peter uh, for, uh, to start us off on the models. Thanks. Uh, yeah, the first uh, uh, one obviously is set up a separate disaster relief agency with uh, an operational capacity. And the model there is uh, 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 FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency in the United States. Uh, we found that option to be relatively unattractive. Uh, uh, FEMA has not been uh, distinguished in, in, in its operations. It's quite an expensive operation uh, to have a huge fire department type organization sitting around. So uh, we sort of set the dedicated federal disaster operational agency aside and said, not, not what we would recommend. The next option we looked at is whether the federal government should uh, mobilize volunteer and skilled labor um, but then there were a host of jurisdictional issues with the provinces and also the uh, federal government doesn't seem to have any comparative advantage in being able to uh, uh, mobilize and uh, run volunteer organizations. So we found that option relatively unattractive as well. And I'll leave the last two to Christian. So the third would be is to stand up um, emergency services organizations at the provincial level. So there's many um, examples of that state emergency services in Australia, Technische Hilfswerk in Germany, um, uh, most European countries in one way or another have, have localized um, basically civilian entities. And some people on the webinar might say, well, we already have that in emergency measures organizations, but Canadian emergency measures organizations are not like state emergency services in Australia in the sense that in Canada, they have no operational capacity. Whereas these emergency services organizations um, in other federations tend to have a small bureaucracy. That small bureaucracy has the mandates of emergency preparedness and working with communities on emergency preparedness. 
emergency response, in particular providing both um, the surge in unskilled labor and the surge in skilled labor. In Australia, for instance, uh, the capacity to surge and to assist with uh, fighting wildfires, for instance, and after action reports on the future of uh, risks and how to mitigate them. And these in many cases come out as a, a Cold War scenario where the military would be defending uh, the country. And so they wouldn't, people wouldn't be able to rely on the military to provide these humanitarian and disaster assistance capabilities. So uh, we needed a civilian organization to provide that. And so what it does particularly well, these organizations is provide skilled and, uns and general labor uh, to be able to surge on very short notice. Uh, and in Australia, they can search thousands of people uh, in a, a matter of uh, hours and days um, and to preposition and select heavy equipment. Because, of course, if you think, for instance, of Canada, when you have to move equipment around, that's going to take lift capacity and you're going to have to then put it back together and assemble it. So it seems that these two functions are precisely the functions that impose the greatest burden on the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, to which the CAF is the least optimized to response. And so these types of local organizations at the provincial level uh, would be perhaps a more effective and sensible approach than to task the reserves with had or domestic assistance uh, or to have the federal government establish its own standalone federal agency. But we have a fourth option. And we actually think that that fourth option might be the best, most efficient and most effective way to uh, do this, which is to have the federal government reprioritize uh, and slightly expand the Canadian Armed Forces in terms of its support for its domestic role. And so here we propose creating a combined capacity of regular and reservists, perhaps around 2,000 or so uh, uh, soldiers, whose main tasking would be to improve infrastructure in remote first nations. So this is a fairly complex tasking. You need skills, you need a lot of planning. But this combined force would spend most of its year liaising, planning, preparing, deploying, um, and then working with the community um, uh, in the summer. And so this would sort of shore up our capabilities with remote First Nations communities. Um, and those activities could be postponed or rescheduled uh, if there's, for instance, a flood or wildfire or other such response to which uh, they would need to respond. And we have precedent for that. So if you look historically in the 1920s and 30s, for instance, as well as in the post-war period, uh, the Air Force was tasked with mapping and charting Canada. And so the result of that was generating skills um, and it generated planes uh, for the bush pilots as well as the bush pilots uh, themselves. And so if you think about everything we've talked about in the context here, we seem to have fairly regular call outs for our Hatter but only twice since the Second World War has the Kenyan Armed Forces had to reprioritize for major combat, the Korean War and the war in Afghanistan. And so one of the things about which we wonder in the paper then whether it, perhaps the logic um, needs to be reversed from rather than seeing Hatter as disrupting normal calf planning uh, activities um, and so, and from uh, to one where we actually do much of the planning um, around Hatter, amount domestic and perhaps continental defense, and where the combat tasking then becomes a plausible but unlikely dis uh, disruptor uh, to these domestic and continental operations. And of course, we have some of that already in the title of the defense uh, statement, which is strong, secure, engaged, so Canada, continent, the world. And yet it seems that the Canadian Armed Forces seems to prioritize for the E and then the other two S's. So we're wondering whether in terms of the policy, there might be a better way sort of to align. And, but we'll close on this. What we didn't include as an option here is um, a new service as part of the Canadian Armed Forces. This is also possibly implicit in SSE because SSE already raises the possibility <coughs> rethinking reserve and regular force, uh, part-time, full-time employment, different types of taskings. Um, and so you might say, well, why don't we just stand this up as a new service in addition to regular and reserve force as part of the Canadian Armed Forces? Uh, and Peter will sort of segue here into the discussion um, on this particular issue and then more broadly with the audience as to why we think the new service might perhaps not be the optimal way to go. Yeah, I, this, uh, the, 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 I think the key thing is, uh, uh, and the, 
previous option that the Canadian Forces needs to uh, ex structure itself slightly differently so that uh, Hatter is not an other related duty, that it is a job and it has an organization and an institutional home. Uh, going to a whole new service just raises, in my mind, a whole bunch of questions that overly complicate this. Uh, it, it is, if this is a special service, uh, 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 is it, is it uh, going to be under the code of service discipline? And if it is, well, why do, what, what makes it so special after all? It could just be a unit. Uh, if it isn't, why should it be part of the military at all? Maybe it needs to be a completely uh, civil organization. Uh, so uh, I think that going and saying we need a whole new uh, branch of the armed services uh, is going way, way too far. Uh, that we can achieve uh, all the operational goals with a much more modest uh, change of simply standing up uh, a, a unit that has had her as its job. Peter, I might propose that we, uh, we, we go through the three questions to which you were online that you've already provided some answers to. Um, and maybe you just want to go first and then I'll, I'll kind of just pile on. So I'll just read the first one out. So the armed forces are dealing with long-term care, um, long-term home and COVID-19 infections. Are they knowledgeable of the viral enemy? And so this, I think, relates also to a question, an open question that had been asked about, do the armed forces have the proper skills and the training uh, to deal with a disaster relief. Peter, do you want to go first on that? Um, well, yeah, I, I mean, I think that, that uh, 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 like many of these taskings, uh, there are a few people that need specialist knowledge and most, most of the participants don't. They need a briefing and uh, 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 in instructions as to what their operation role is. And beyond that, it really is non-specialized labor. Yeah, I would also say that this, of course, is, I think, a, uh, a the pandemic does raise interesting questions for the Department of National Defense and Kenya Armed Forces because, of course, the CAF no longer runs its own hospitals. And it's the medical service that it runs is really only has capacity to serve the CAF. So if Canadians, I think, expect the Canadian Armed Forces to step up uh, in a pandemic with specialized um, intelligence capabilities on, uh, um, on the possible virus with specialized medical capabilities or so, uh, I would probably hypothesize the Canadian Armed Forces are currently not resourced to do that. Um, and so uh, that then becomes a zero sum game. If that's something that Canadians want the Canadian Armed Forces to do more of and to be more be able to uh, be, be, be capable to assist, especially on short notice, uh, then that's a significant additional expectation um, of the force, I would say, uh, that would require some public discussion because of course, without new money, uh, it always means that there's something else that's going to have to give. The, um, uh, there was a question for you, Peter, on do officer trainees at RMC have the proper training for disaster relief and developing the professional Canadian Forces officer uh, for uh, this? And I guess that also comes in the context of our remarks about um, the, the, the away game versus the home game and how the Canadian Armed Forces prioritize yeah. it. And a lot of it's when you look at, when you look at Hatter operations, uh, uh, what they are calling up in terms of technical skills are people's base level occupational skills, uh, be they officer or, or uh, uh, non-commissioned member. They're looking at base level skills. Uh, uh, Airplane flying is one of them. Uh, doing engineering is another. Sometimes you have to do, take care of bridge and telecommunications. Signals is another. So you're going right back to the basics. You're doing your military job, but in a domestic civilian context. Uh, there, there is not a lot of exotic skills required for most of these. 
but what is needed is the institutional and organizational capacity to deliver a lot of people and service in a very short period of time. And so it's more the institutional capacity that the armed forces represent rather than you know any individual specialist skills. Uh, I don't see uh, uh, a, a lot of actual specialist skills having arisen from most of these. Perhaps COVID is uh, an exception, but once again, for most of the participants, it was pretty, pretty simple, pretty basic. So yeah, you might need that layer of, of very highly trained specialist people, but depending on what the emergency is going to be, you may have to bring them in from another agency. And I think the, the, uh, the question with regards to RMCs, of course, yeah, what specifically might we do? But the broader, I think, context is that uh, if you look at civilian universities, I mean, by and large, there's very little conversation about security, defense sort of components. Uh, and I would venture that even in most courses where it comes up, uh, there's no conversation about uh, hatter and, and domestic sort of humanitarian assistance that might be provided by the Kenyan Armed Forces. Whereas uh, I would venture to say that um, one of the benefits of RMC is that students are at least exposed to that particular component of the mission and uh, have a sense um, in, of, of, of the, that, that this is part of their expectations and have the, uh, have the broad sort of core capabilities as a result of the broad courses that uh, we have across the humanities, social sciences, sciences, and engineering, that they have an understanding of the very, of, of all the multifaceted elements uh, that these missions tend to, uh, tend to bring to bear. Um, because, I mean, as an, as an officer uh, in most of these operations, you are still taking your direction from uh, from civilians. And so uh, it means you have to understand some of that civil military relationship and what your particular role as an officer is in that situation. Um, and so I'd say that's uh, one of the advantage of having a, a military university that people do come out with uh, um, with that understanding. Then there's, uh, there's a couple of questions here that I think I'll roll into one. One is sort of, you might as well just use the, the Red Cross to do all this. Um, and the other is sort of why use the Canadian Armed Forces um, um, uh, when we could just pay people through, um, we, we could just pay people to do this uh, and, and have this capacity sort of within, within other elements. Um, I'll, I'll try maybe an, an initial sort of response sort of on my end that of course, as we've already shown, uh, there's no organization in the country that other than the Canadian Armed Forces that has the lift capacity uh, that is often required um, uh, in these types of uh, circumstances um, and that has the ability to deploy with the very multifaceted sort of skill set. Now that I think question then harkens to uh, would it be in the interest of Ken and of provinces to build up uh, the sort of provincial emergency services organizations that we see in most other uh, federations? Um, and so I think that is sort of a, a medium term question that I think the provinces and the federal government will need to think about, uh, because I think what the question hints at is we could probably do better in terms of the mix of civilian capabilities and uniform capabilities. Uh, and currently it's difficult on the short notice to find uh, the uh, civilian capabilities that are sometimes needed or there's legal liabilities and other sorts of issues that come into play where then the government says, well, let's just send the military and, uh, and be done with it. Peter, did you have a reaction to that? Uh, no, I just had a, 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 a thought going back to uh, uh, skill sets required uh, uh, in order to manage emergencies. Uh, one, of, one of the things that, it, if you look at the literature such as it is, it comes out is that uh, uh, the military is going to inevitably have to have to work with civilian organizations, especially with NGOs like the Red Cross. And there are a lot, a lot of cultural differences between a hierarchical command-based uh, organization like the military and something that's more looser, more consensual, uh, and informal, like an NGO organization, and having to interface 
uh, across organizations that have different operating styles is not easy. And it's certainly something that probably should be further developed on both sides of the fence. There's a question about the long-term recovery and the best agency to use. And I think this gets at how do we actually mitigate against this risk in the first place, in particular when it comes to floods, but also with regards to the ice storm. Um, there's some debate about how effective the mitigation sort of mechanisms have been. And ultimately, um, you need to wait for something similar to occur to see uh, to, to, to see how effective, for instance, the, uh, the mitigation mechanisms on the electricity grid uh, have been after the ice storm and after the blackout in 2003. But we know if you, for instance, follow it as a case study, the municipality of Wood Buffalo, uh, more commonly known as uh, Fort McMurray in, uh, in Alberta, uh, where the flood mitigation um, uh, is, 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 is a major construction project that is underway, uh, but is delayed uh, for a whole number of reasons, a lot of it also due to, uh, due to funding and due to the economic downturn and so forth. So what is it that we can do to make sure that the project that we have on the go and that we've identified actually get funded and that they stay on time and on schedule because uh, Fort McMurray is unfortunately uh, a case study in, well, we can just push it off for another year because we don't have the funding. And then it turns out that exactly in that year where you push it off, uh, you do end up getting the, uh, getting the big flood. And so what sort of premium do you pay um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the insurance here uh, that you're willing to invest? Peter, did you want to comment on the long-term? Yeah, I just, just want to pile on with one comment is that the federal government has really dropped the ball on uh, risk assessment and risk management. Uh, the uh, uh, national security policy of 2004, I think, was the last kick at the can. And it said, you know, like all, all, all hazards were gonna be looked at and it quickly got narrowed down to counterterrorism and sort of stayed there for 10 years. So it's, it's a file that needs to be revisited. Yeah, some people have facetiously called this the no hazards approach to uh, <laughs> uh, so, policy. We're just at the end of the hour. There are two questions that are outstanding, and I think we can kind of combine them into one. Um, the question about is the Canadian Armed Forces capacity on the human side and in terms of the, the equipment and everything sufficient to do everything that is required? And where are we in terms of our 2% of GDP commitment to NATO, which of course- Halfway. Interconnected, <laughs> yes. Halfway to the 2%. Yeah. And yes, it counts. Yeah, we would count it in our, in, in our NATO accounts. I mean, the 2% has always been an aspirational goal, but uh, of course, what Canada always likes to say, it's the three Cs, cash capability and commitments. And I think what some of the concern might be within the Canadian Armed Forces is, of course, that the more we do in terms of Hatter, that that's a, that's a draw on resources. And so those resources are not there then as capabilities and commitments necessarily to, uh, to deploy internationally. And that that's then what might reflect poorly uh, in terms of our relationships, both with the United States and within the, uh, within the NATO alliance. Uh, so I think it's less about exact how much exactly do we spend, but I think the broader recognition that whatever it is that we currently spend, there just doesn't seem to be enough um, equipment and there doesn't seem to be enough people uh, to go around to, to do everything that we want to do, that we committed to doing, and that it's in Canada's interest, both domestically, continentally, and internationally, uh, to, um, um, uh, to do. Um, Peter, did you have a reflection on the, on, on, on the first question that, um, uh, that, uh, that Warren had raised, um, the, the, the human resources and logistical material and whether those are sufficient and what's required in the reserve capacity um, in the case of an extraordinary crisis? Well, I mean, obviously, obviously uh, it's in, insufficient now. And with reserves, there are the additional problem that um, reserves are, have been a revolving door. So, you know, you've got a, a large portion of your reserves 
it has drifted up to as high as 50% for the, for the Army Reserve that has one year or slightly less than one year of service. So they've basically not, they don't have their basic military skills yet. Uh, and the other thing with reserves is there's job protection legislation is pretty weak. Uh, I don't, don't think it will uh, 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 allow them to be called out. And it's always optional. If you're a reservist, you don't have to turn up. So uh, any, any, any resources that you see in a reserve bucket have to be looked at closely. Are they really trained? Are they really going to be available? And uh, how much bootstrapping will have to be done to those reservists to make them useful? And without, without changing our legislative structure, it's not likely that's going to get any better quick. Yeah, that's a controversial issue because then there might be also concerns if we introduce that legislation, then perhaps employers might be less likely to hire individuals who might be in the reserves. And that's been the longstanding argument against uh, more blanket job uh, protection legislation for reservists. Uh, uh, so uh, until that problem is solved, it's not, like I say, it's unlikely to get much better in terms of availability of a reservist for any role. So I hope we've convinced uh, uh, people who are with us today that this is a complex topic that is much more multifaceted than simply just give it to this organization or, or that organization, but that there are some clear trends that we can identify, some clear challenges, uh, that there is need for, for action both within the department and uh, by political authorities in terms of what exactly the tasking needs to be. There needs to be consideration of the resourcing. Uh, it can't just be one more thing that we ask the Canadian Armed Forces to do in addition to, uh, to everything else and that there is sort of some, uh, some systematic uh, thought that, uh, that, needs to be, uh, that needs to be given to this in terms of a broader conversation about, uh, um, about defense policy and how in particular defense policy and posture uh, affects, uh, affects us here at home and what implications that has for the Canadian Armed Forces to do other things abroad uh, that, uh, um, that are equally important. So I think this is a great place for us to wind up. I want to thank uh, Peter and Christian for joining us today. Uh, I think this has been a fascinating discussion. You know, uh, the range of challenges that we're facing as society, uh, everything from, you know, pandemics and hospitals and those pieces to fires and floods. Uh, it's clear that we need capacity to be able to respond and that those needs are going to increase in the future. Uh, Christian and Peter, I think you've given us some really good insights as to how we might be able to uh, put those resources together. And I appreciate you uh, leading us through this discussion. So a virtual round of applause for our <laughs> two speakers. I realize that can't hear any applause, but we're applauding for you. Um, again, thank you so much to everybody online for joining us. Uh, we are meeting on almost a weekly basis for these Contagion Culture Lectures, uh, and we hope that we'll see you again at the next one. Thanks very much. Have thank a great you. day. <laughs>